Good afternoon. My name is Seth Arns. And myself and Mark Coles Ritchie will be talking to you today about the recovery of riparian and hanging guard ecosystems as a consequence of drought in the Lake Powell region. Now, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the general situation in Lake Powell, a four year study I've been working on to understand how ecosystems are reestablishing in the Lake Powell region in areas that were once inundated by the reservoir. Then I'll talk to you a bit about stream restoration as it's occurring right now. And then I'll transition to Mark. Mark will talk a bit more about riparian ecosystem restoration. And then finally about unique plants and those found in hanging garden ecosystems. So these two images here are two satellite images showing Lake Powell uh, in the Bullfrog Bay region in 2011 and 2022. And you can see the image in 2011 uh, has a relative, has a pretty much full bull, Bullfrog Bay on the right and Halls Creek Bay on the left. The image on the right in 2022, 11 years later, Halls Creek Bay is completely dewatered on the left and Bullfrog Bay is substantially reduced in size. This represents about 110 foot drop in Lake Powell elevations. And in fact, since 2000, when the lake was last full, Lake Powell has dropped 180 feet over these 25 years. And the Lake Powell region and most of the Four Corners region in the desert southwest has been in drought since 2000. And in fact, this is a mega drought. And in many locations in this region, it's the worst drought the area has seen in 1200 years. This rapid decline in Lake Powell elevations has been caused by how we use water in the West, how water is used in the Colorado River Basin, drought and climate change. All of these three factors working in tandem are really creating the situation in Lake Powell and how dry it is. As an ecologist, what I'm most interested in is what's happening on those landscapes that were once inundated by Lake Powell. How are these ecosystems recovering? Are there robust ecosystems reestablishing? And just to give you a sense of the scale of scope of these systems, uh, at the current all-time low elevation of Lake Powell, 3,521 feet, so that's just about a 180-foot drop from full pool elevation, there is over 100,000 acres of land that is now a terrestrial system that was once underwater in the last 20 years. Now, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the work I've been doing in the Lake Powell region. So last year I started a four-year study in a broad sense to understand what sorts of ecosystems and plants are reestablishing in the Lake Powell region on areas that were once inundated by the reservoir and how these systems are changing over time. So over the first two years of the study, I'll be establishing plant survey sites, primarily in tributary canyons in Glen Canyon and Lake Powell, also along the main stem of some of the rivers, the upper reaches of the Colorado and the San Juan River. In years three and four of the study, I'll resurvey these sites to try to understand how these sites are changing over time. In 2022, I surveyed 40, established 40 plant survey sites in nine tributary canyons in the central Glen Canyon, Lake Powell region. From a little bit upstream, up reservoir of Bullfrog Bay Marina to just downstream of the San Juan Arm. So I want to show you a little bit about how these systems are restoring. And I'm going to take you on a little bit of a pictorial walking tour up one of these tributary canyons, Moki Canyon, and to give you a sense of how the systems are reestablishing. One of the things that is most remarkable about what's going on is the speed at which these ecosystems are recovering, especially in a canyon like Moki where there's perennially flowing water. So the image on the left here is Moki Canyon just above lake level, uh, 35, 23 feet. This landscape here on the left, you can see completely devoid of plants, at least right down in the drainage, uh, was uncovered about a week prior. The image on the right at an elevation just below 3,600 feet has been uncovered for about a year and a half. And you can see that there are 
there is some restoration happening happening here. There's larger shrubs. Those are primarily coyote willow, Salix exigua. There's also native grasses and also some weedy species mixed in. Some of these are non-invasive. In this particular tributary canyon, the establishment of native species is really robust. It's really only in the first couple miles, the lowest elevations of Moki Canyon, where you are seeing a higher abundance of invasives, especially Russian thistle. There's quite a bit of Russian thistle in the lower reaches of this canyon. As you move a little higher up the canyon to a little over 3,600 feet on the left, uh, this is a landscape that has been uncovered for two to three years. And you can see there is a very robust coverage of coyote willow on the banks on the right of the image. You also see some taller trees. These are cottonwoods. Some of these cottonwoods have established in areas that are a little perched above the elevation of the stream and were uncovered probably for six to 12 years. The image on the right shows an area at 36, 35 feet that has been uncovered for five to 11 years. And here there's really robust coverage of coyote willow. You can see some cottonwoods all the way at the back of the image. So some of this landscape uh, at the very bottom of the drainage here was inundated briefly for two to three months in 2017. And much of the rest of what you're seeing has been out of water for approximately 11 years. The image on the left is in Moki Canyon, about 3645 feet, and this is a landscape that has been out of water for 11 years. In many tributary canyons, beavers have recolonized. This image here shows a beaver dam, lots of coyote willow, uh, some typha there in the foreground, and taller cottonwoods in the background. Some of those cottonwoods are 30 to 50 feet in height, and they're probably in locations that have been out of water for 20 years because, again, they're perched a little bit above the level of the stream. And finally, the image on the right shows a location just below the high water mark of Lake Powell. This is a landscape that has been uncovered for over 20 years. And while there's not as much coverage of, say, coyote willow here, you are see seeing some baccarus in the foreground and relatively tall and mature cottonwoods in the background. And with that, I'll pass things over to Mark, who's going to talk a bit more about riparian ecosystem restoration and the unique plant species found in hanging gardens. My name is Mark Coles Ritchie. I work for Grand Canyon Trust. Now I'm gonna talk about wetland vegetation recovery in Glen Canyon. I'm gonna talk about two different settings. One is the riparian setting, as you can see in the photo on the left. And this refers to stream side areas. In that photo, the stream is going down the middle and on the side you have riparian vegetation. The other setting is called a hanging garden. This is where groundwater discharges from a wall, like a crack in the wall or a seam. And where that water discharges, plants can grow. And this is a unique setting that creates a unique plant community and really a rare community in the southwest where we don't have a lot of surface water unless you create a dam and a reservoir. Riparian plants have mechanisms that allow them to thrive amid disturbance. Some examples are shown in these photos. The upper left photo shows coyote willow with its rhizomes that can go down to get to water or maybe they were going up through the sediment to get out of buried deposited sediment. Either way it shows the ability of this riparian plant, coyote willow, to take to deal with challenging circumstances such as disturbance. The bottom photos show Fremont cottonwood. The left photo has the capsules that produce the seeds that float into the wind and start to grow with, where they land on most moist soil, such as in the lower right photo, where you see hundreds or perhaps thousands of cottonwood seedlings. The upper photo shows uh, what the process of what seeds how they're transported by water. In this case, these are petals of Veronica, but it shows the mechanism that happens when seeds land in the water and then uh, get transported to moist sediment where they can grow. Uh, another mechanism the riparian, some riparian plants have is tolerance of waterlogged soils, which allows them to survive in flooding, which has anoxic conditions. Colonizer plants are plants that grow in disturbed 
soils at disturbed settings. And close to Lake Powell is a setting where these colonizer plants are doing really well. There, after the lake receded, there was a lot of bare soil that could be colonized by plants that take advantage and thrive in those settings. And here's some examples. The lower left photo shows coyote willow and tamarisk growing on an old terrace that was probably the bottom of the reservoir at one point. The lower right photos show annual rabbit's foot grass, polypogon monspilensis, uh, an annual plant that thrives in disturbed areas, and it's dominating that lower right photo. That's the only plant pretty much in that photo. The upper right photo shows a number of different colonizer species, grasses and forbs that are growing on the margin of a stream flowing down this canyon. And the upper middle photo shows Russian thistle um, or tumbleweed that has accumulated in this stream channel. All of these are colonizer plants that do well in disturbed settings. Right, native riparian plants are also present in these canyons, especially as you move further away from the reservoir. And these photos show some of the native graminoids or grass-like plants. The upper left photo is bottle brush sedge, Carex hysterocyna. The lower left photo also has Carex hysterocyna surrounded by Juncus arcticus, uh, a rush that's rhizomatous and spreads out in riparian settings. The lower middle photo shows hard stem bulrush, Schenoplectus acutus, growing in very wet soils. The upper middle photo shows woolly sedge, Carex pelita, also grows in riparian settings. And on the right, cattail, typha species that also has rhizomes and spreads out. The stream channel is actually in the middle of this photo, but you can't see it because the riparian vegetation is so dense. Woody plants take a little longer to establish after disturbance. Um, first the graminoids and the forbs come in, and then woody plants establish and start to thrive. And that's what we see in these photos. On the left, those willows on the, alongside the stream, coyote willow, Salix exigua, and Gooding's willow, Salix goodingi, are really abundant there. The middle photo shows just a single cottonwood uh, sapling that's starting to grow. It takes a longer period of time for, for cottonwoods to, to grow. And on the right, you see a dense patch of willows showing really impressive regrowth in an area that was once under Lake Powell. Here's an image showing a riparian area in Reflection Canyon that has only been uh, uncovered from Lake Powell for three years. And look at how those willows are thriving on the left side of the screen and in the distance. Now I'm going to talk about hanging gardens. We encountered a number of hanging gardens uh, in the survey work that we did. Here are five. On this map, you can see the numbers along the side canyons, the, the main channel being the Colorado River and the side canyons being tributaries. And these range in age from 22 to just a few years since they were inundated by Lake Powell. This site we call Hanging Garden One. It emerged from, from being covered by Lake Powell 22 years ago, and it has abundant hanging garden vegetation, such as crimson monkey flower, erythranthi eastwoodii, better known as mimulus eastwoodii to me and to many people. And it has those beautiful reddish, orangish flowers that you can see in that lower photo, uh, a spectacular plant that, that grows on those rock walls where water is discharging. This site is thriving because it's been exposed for uh, 22 years. This hanging garden is really interesting because the upper portion was never inundated by the reservoir, but the lower portion was only exposed four years ago. And that explains the, the dense vegetation of the upper part of this hanging garden and the more sparse vegetation lower down. I imagine that the upper part of this hanging garden is providing seeds and vegetative material that will help disperse to the lower part of the wall and provide opportunities for increased vegetation on that lower part of the wall. In this photo on the left side, you can see a hanging garden where that crack is, where groundwater is discharging and supporting a robust community of common maidenhair, Adiantum capillus veneris. This site has only been exposed for 11 years, and already you can see a thriving hanging garden community. Here's a wet wall hanging garden that's a lot younger because it's only been exposed for two years, so you don't see much vegetation on this wall, uh, it's just reestablishing, and over time, hopefully, it will 
uh, increase in abundance as vegetation has a, a chance to grow on this wet wall. This spring site was fun to observe because it had so much stream orchid, Epipactus gigantea, the flower in all of these photos, but the close-up on the right photo. This is a spring plant that uh, is relatively rare, doesn't grow very many places, and so we were excited to find it in great abundance at this site that has only been outside of the Lake Powell for three years. It shows an impressive ability for this plant and this community to reestablish after disturbance. So what we found in our field work is that recovery is happening. The lower areas closer to the reservoir are sparsely vegetated. They're first being uh, colonized by weedy annual plants and some native plants, um, but there's not as much vegetation and not as much native vegetation there yet. As we went upstream, we found more robust wetland vegetation, native species that were thriving along the stream, willows, cottonwoods, sedges, and rushes. So the question is, will the weedy areas closer to the reservoir transition to native plant communities? I'm hopeful that they will, and here is some evidence that they, that they will. The photo on the left shows Seth standing in a patch of rabbit's foot grass, that annual weedy plant that's not native. But next to him, just to the side, there's a little patch of cattails. This gives me hope that that native species, cattail, can grow and spread out and thrive in this setting and displace the non-native annual rabbit's foot grass. In the middle photo, you see this person holding the stem of an, a coyote willow, another hopeful example of a native species that can come in and displace the non-natives. And hopefully those sites will transition to what you see on the right, which is that robust uh, cattail community with other sedges and rushes and willows and cottonwoods all around it. Seth and I would like to acknowledge the logistical and financial support of three nonprofit organizations, Glen Canyon Institute, Western Water Assessment, and Grand Canyon Trust. This work was done in Glen Canyon National Recreation Area with their permits and support. We also acknowledge that these are the traditional homelands of indigenous people who have lived here for thousands of years, and this is the cultural landscape of numerous tribes. Thank you.